Crockett's White Tech infiltrate a white supremacist group to investigate the murders of concentration camp survivors on today's Miami Vice. Victims of Circumstance was directed by Colin Buxey and was written by Richard Lurie. This is Lurie's sole Miami Vice credit, and as the subject matter would indicate, it's a pretty grim and humorless episode. To the haunting strains of Severance by avant-garde music project Dead Can Dance, an elderly German man named Hans Kovac, played by William Hickey, clutches a knife and looks in terror at his front door, outside which can be heard distorted voices. Throughout this episode, we'll periodically return to Kovac, who keeps hallucinating that someone is trying to break into his apartment. These scenes are shot and staged in a way to evoke the iconic look of the famous 1920 German expressionist film The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari which is a very cool touch. We then join up with Crockett and Tubbs, who are conducting surveillance on a trio of drug-dealing brothers, Ernesto Enrique and Angelo Alvarez, who are sitting in a booth at a greasy spoon while discussing their business. Angelo is played by John Leguizamo, who of course played the villainous Orlando Calderon in the episode Sons and Lovers and The Afternoon Plane. Angelo leaves the diner to attend to business. Immediately thereafter, a masked figure enters and shoots both remaining Alvarez brothers along with the diner owner and a busboy. Tubbs and Crockett burst in, but the shooter escapes. At the crime scene, they're joined by Detective Bailey, played by Xander Berkeley, who also appeared in last season's Like a Hurricane. As the bodies are carried out, it's clear the diner owner has a number tattooed on his arm, indicating that he was a World War II concentration camp survivor. Suspecting Angelo was behind the hit on his brothers, Crockett and Tubbs track him down. Angelo goes to pieces at the news of his brother's deaths. He points Tubbs and Crockett in the direction of the Diablos, a new gang that has recently carried out a number of high-profile hits on drug dealers. Acting on Angelo's information, Tubbs and Crockett observe of a drug deal going down at the waterfront. The Diablos arrive and kill the dealers and steal their stash, but Crockett and Tubbs move in to arrest them. One of the Diablos is killed while fleeing, and the other is taken into custody. They question him, but he has an airtight alibi for the diner killings. Detective Bailey tells them about another violent hit like the one at the diner. An elderly couple named Art and Sylvia Kravitz are gunned down along with a bystander. Art and Sylvia have concentration camp tattoos on their arms, and Crockett and Tubbs realize the Alvarez brothers were just bystanders in the diner hit. The real target was the diner owner. Rocket Tubbs and Bailey talk to Dr. Leo Krebs, played by Stefan Girash, who runs a foundation dedicated to tracking down Nazi war criminals. He came forward because the diner owner and Art and Sylvia Kravitz were all scheduled to testify against Hans Kovac, the man from the opening sequence, who ran the concentration camp all three were imprisoned in. Krebs mentions he still has two witnesses willing to testify against Kozak. One is a man named Jacob Hoffman, who lives in a Miami area nursing home. When Crockett asks about the other witness, Krebs just shows him the number tattooed on his own arm. Krebs received a threatening letter from a white supremacist group run by a man named John Baker. Hoping to lure Baker and his group out into the open, Crockett, Tubbs, and Switek attend a speech Krebs gives about the Holocaust. Baker's group disrupts the speech, and Crockett and Switek, pretending to be sympathetic to Baker's cause, start a brawl. Baker and his group, including Crockett and Switek, are hauled off to jail. Crockett and Switek ingratiate themselves with Baker, who bails them out and invites them to join his group. Baker is played by CSI's Paul Guilfoyle, who we saw last season in Death and the Lady. Outside the jail, Baker is approached by a woman who identifies herself as a journalist named Helen Jackson, who is played by 1970s screen icon Karen Black, famous for roles in films like Five Easy Pieces and Nashville. Baker rebuffs her attempts to get an interview, so she turns to Crockett and Switek for help. She assures them she's sympathetic to the cause of white supremacy and gives them her contact information to pass along to Baker. Crockett and Switek drag Baker out in the middle of the night and prove their loyalty to him by pipe bombing a Jewish owned deli. Holy crap, it is an absolutely horrifying scene. There's some dialogue that was obviously added in post production in which Crockett and Switek mentioned to each other that the deli was abandoned and slated for demolition. I'm glad that dialogue was added, but I remain absolutely horrified that apparently this scene was scripted and shot, and then someone on the Miami Vice production team thought, oh yeah, we should probably make it clear that Crockett and Switek didn't just pipe bomb a Jewish owned business to ingratiate themselves to a bunch of Nazis. Baker is impressed by their moxie, so he invites Crockett over to his mansion and shows him his personal computer, where he's collected an extensive database on anyone he regards as an enemy, i.e. non-whites, gays, and anyone of the Jewish faith. Crockett convinces Baker to speak to the journalist, Helen Jackson, to spread his ideology to a bigger audience. So Baker meets with Helen in a hotel room for an interview, while Crockett and Tubbs eavesdrop on their conversation, hoping he'll say something to implicate himself in the killings. Baker is called away from the interview for a top-secret engagement. Switek and Crockett follow along, hoping it'll turn out to be linked to the murders. It turns out to be a big torch-lit group meeting, complete with long-winded speeches. 
Crockett refers to it as a fascist pep rally, and he's not wrong. While this is going on, someone breaks into Baker's house and accesses the files on his computer. An irate Baker tells Crockett he's sure Dr. Krebs was behind the break-in because a disc containing all his information on Krebs was stolen. At a nursing home, Holocaust survivor Jacob Hoffman is under heavy police protection until he testifies against Kozak. Helen Jackson impersonates a nurse and murders him. Helen visits Kozak, and it turns out she's his daughter. She's been murdering everyone scheduled to testify against him. Kozak urges her to murder Dr. Krebs as well. At the nursing home, a bystander gives a description of Hoffman's nurse to Tubbs and Crockett, and they realize that Helen is the killer. Helen gains access to Dr. Krebs by telling him that her father was at the same concentration camp he was at, which is one way to put it. Before she can kill him, Baker bursts in and interrupts them, still convinced that Dr. Krebs was behind the break-in at his home. Helen pulls a gun and kills Baker, and then Crockett and Tubbs arrive and arrest her before she can shoot Dr. Krebs. As Crockett and Tubbs march Helen out of the building, Angelo Alvarez pops up and kills her to avenge his brothers. While Misguided Angel by Cowboy Junkies plays, Crockett shoots Angelo as he flees the scene. As with pretty much anything dealing with the lingering effects of the Holocaust, this is a pretty grim episode. That Caligari homage in the opening sequence with the design of Kozak's apartment juxtaposed with that great Dead Can Dance song is a nice showpiece, and the twist with Helen turning out to be the killer is pretty surprising. It's not an enjoyable episode, because wringing entertainment value out of the Holocaust or out of white supremacists is an uphill battle. It's rough watching Crockett and Switek posing as racists and disrupting a speech by a concentration camp survivor and bombing a Jewish-owned business. But it's done well, with a nice guest turn from Karen Black, and as we draw close to the end of the series, it's great seeing John Leguizamo again. Leguizamo is one of those guest stars who is important to Miami Vice, and even though Orlando Calderon is long dead, it still seems right that they would bring Leguizamo back one final time. I'm gonna go with Three Flamingos. This was the last episode to air on NBC before the series finale, though there are four additional episodes that didn't air during the series' initial run. It makes more sense to me to deal with those four episodes before tackling the finale, so next time I'm going to be looking at World of Trouble, which sees the return of Dennis Farina as Al Lombard. Be sure to meet me back here for that, and enjoy your week. <laughs>